this was one of the best decisions in my life ever and it came just at the right time. Aujourd'hui, j'interview Zvetoslav. Il est ukrainien et cardiologue à Kiev en Ukraine. J'ai voulu recueillir son témoignage en tant que jeune personne dans un pays en guerre. J'ai beaucoup appris en écoutant son récit, j'espère qu'il vous plaira autant qu'à moi. OK. <laughs> On the 24th of February 2022, Russia invaded Ukraine. What was your reaction to this invasion? Well, I was expecting something terrible to happen. So when I woke up on the morning of February 24th and checked the news, I saw what I expected to see sometime or another. Actually, I did not hear the explosions. At that time, I lived with my parents and my sister did hear them a couple minutes earlier, but I didn't. I just woke up, opened the news, uh, saw the uh, declaration of war from the uh, Russian president. Then I exited my room and met my mother, who told me, uh, son, there is a war. And I said, I know, I need to go to the gas station. Uh, so that's what the first thing I did. I did not really processed the emotions that time i was uh, very collected and i understood that um, it is very important at how you prepare and how, what you do uh, to survive this event so the first thing i did i went to the gas station and while i was going there i saw the cars piling up at the entrance of gas station so at the time i made a circle and near it there was like 40 to 45 cars in front of the gas station so i thought no i'm gonna do what uh, i have in, in my gas tank then i went back home and uh, went to the grocery store near our home to buy some supplies and uh, Uh, the funny thing that there was nobody in the store uh, i was like the first uh, customer after the opening to uh, c come by and there was no one so i started to pack everything i could uh, you, you know the beans the pasta everything that has a long shelf life and And a couple of guys entered the store and they bought like a bottle of yogurt, a bottle of beer, like something like that, one item. And they looked at me uh, rummaging around the store and grabbing everything I can, like uh, on the, some sort of weirdo. Uh, but after me, in 10 to 15 minutes, there were uh, already three or four people who came like me to start and pack and prepare uh, for the food shortage, for the shortages, because this is what we first associate with world. So there will be no guests, there will be no food. And after that, when I um, packed all the supplies, uh, I went back, I told, uh, speak, spoke to my parents, uh, they were like very depressed and uh, they didn't know what to do, but I knew what I should do. Uh, I'm a doctor, I work in the emergency department. I felt like I should be at my workplace when something like this happens because you know doctor without a hospital is like a musician without an instrument <laughs> you cannot really do much so uh, i packed my food kissed my sister goodbye and went to work and actually i went back home in two weeks after that why did you came only uh, after two weeks uh, you see the first weeks or first two to three weeks of the war here in kiev we were expecting the attacks on the air force and between my hospital and my uh, apartment there was a road leading to one of the airports to the city so this road was heavily guarded and there were some fights on this road with so-called infiltration groups or maybe it was friendly fire between the defenders of the city no one really knows but the road was not safe as far as i could Uh, evaluate it. So I did not take unnecessary risk. That's the first reason. And the second reason is that I had a, not much gas in my gas tank. So I preferred not to spend it going back from work to home or work to home. And we had some job to do at my workplace. We had some uh, uh, people come in with gunshot wounds, with blast wounds. So I could stay there and be productive and help. So that's what I did. How did you cope uh, with the, the beginning of the war? I uh, spent a lot of time monitoring what was going on and trying to develop new patterns in uh, searching for information and analyzing information. 
I uh, did everything I can to grab as much intelligence as possible about what was happening across the country and trying to save it for future. In this quest, the one thing I found really helpful was Twitter. I just put on the name of the village in Kherson Oblast or in the Kyiv region and just read all the tweets about that or watch all photos about that and see in real time the bridges being blown, the forces being repelled, overcoming the defenses and storming the cities, the crowds of people gathering to uh, protest the entrance of Russian forces in the villages, in the Kherson region, in the Sumer region, in the Kiev region. And this really helped uh, not being isolated, not being uh, unaware of what is going on, but being connected and uh, seeing what actually is happening on the ground. On the other hand, the official communication was really profound. All governments, starting from the president to ministers, they regularly came uh, online to inform us on the developing situation, which was terrible. But they were just there informing the people that the uh, country is doing everything it can to defend itself and to repel the attack. And this was something really helpful to develop a sense of uh, community, the sense uh, that we are the people that are together in this amazingly hard time for our country. This was the second thing that really helped. So as far as I can say, uh, the most helpful thing uh, in such unstable and unknown situation is being connected, being connected with outside world, being connected with other people uh, like you. That is what really helps to stay sane and not fall into panic. It really helped me uh, a couple days later when the rocket flew in the building just a few blocks from my hospital. The whole world saw the pictures of this skyscraper because this is this was the first big residential building in Kyiv damaged by the rocket. I actually went there on the fifth or the sixth day and uh, took a couple of pictures. Uh, the one thing that really uh, hit me hard was child's journal, sco school journal uh, with, you know, the lessons and the marks uh, be just lying on the ground in the pile of rubble with some other things that were blown up from the apartment with the explosion. This was the first moment when I actually felt the reality of the war. This is um, the moment when everything changes for you. And after that, I could not judge the people who did not take the war seriously. Uh, people abroad who did not experience something like this firsthand, they really can sense it like some of many things that is going on behind the screen of the tablet or a phone. And it is really easy to dismiss that as something that is not that relevant to your everyday life. But when you come and see the place in person, it hits you differently. It leaves a mark. After that, I saw in a very different light what happened in Syria, what happens now in Turkey and Syria and in other conflict zones around the world, because now I know this feeling of being there first-handed and seeing the harsh reality of the war, which is heartbreaking, which is enraging, which is devastating. And after that, actually what helped uh, was sharing my experience with my friends and uh, seeing they being outraged and feeling their support. This was the second thing that really hit me. The third thing uh, happened on February 27th when Russia set their nuclear deterrent forces on the state of high alert. That morning, our administration called me 
and they asked me to find some tutorials and instructions on the algorithm of actions of medical workers in the case of nuclear explosion. So we can prepare for the possible nuclear escalation and provide help in our hospital to the injured citizens. I was like, are you for real? They told me like, yes. Uh, and one more thing, please don't tell anyone here in the hospital. We don't want the panic. I came <laughs> out of the uh, office and thought, that's okay, I will panic for everyone. Uh, that's what I did. For the rest of the day, there were a lot of air raid alerts that day. I ran to the basement where we have the shelter. Every time I heard the air alert and I was like sitting there and feeling extremely anxious and extremely nervous. And by the end of the day, I was so put out of my normal state of mind that I felt like I'm really gonna go crazy some moment that, that day. And that's why when uh, my peers, uh, my fellow young surgeons helped me because uh, I found a guitar in the basement and we just sat uh, there and played Ukrainian songs, traditional Ukrainian songs, uh, the war songs of uh, um, Ukrainian National Army from 100 years ago and the pop songs from Eurovision and um, that kind of helped. I don't know, we just uh, sat there and we stopped thinking about all the uh, horrors of uh, possible nuclear explosion going on. And the next day when I woke up, I thought, well, whatever. If it detonates, it detonates. What can you do about this? Not that much. So um, the presence of other people around is really important to cope with what is going on, especially when you're just adapting to the new reality of life. There will be easier times. I am a strong believer in that. I hope soon. Si cette vidéo vous plaît, je vous invite à aller voir également l'interview d'Arina, une jeune ukrainienne qui vit en France depuis 5 ans. Elle est juste ici. How do you see this war uh, continuing? I do not uh, make any prognosis uh, on uh, how it will uh, play out in the nearest future, but I see that uh, strategically uh, this war can not end in the victory of Russia as Russia imagines it. I see that in order to reject them this privilege of waging an aggressive war and winning, uh, we are losing a lot of our potential, uh, a lot of our brightest people, a lot of our most patriotic, most uh, brave men and women. And this is uh, something that will leave a scar. And the longer the war prolongs, the deeper this scar will be. Uh, so so I know this saying that in the Nazi con concentration camps, the first ones to give up were the ones who thought that this will end in the nearest future. Tomorrow the horror will end. The second ones to give up were the ones who thought that the horror will never end, that it is forever. And the only ones who kept their sanity and who came out of the imprisonment and started a meaningful life uh, again were the people who thought uh, what they can do right now, what they should do tomorrow lived in the moment, uh, not thinking about the uh, perspectives uh, too much. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm concentrated on the goals that I have in my personal and professional life, and I accepted the reality of the war. I make all the necessary precautions. I monitor the situation to see if I should prepare for another, you know, big invasion of, of my city, which is uh, not really seen like that at the moment. So th this is it for me, like a regular person, one of the millions in the country who is not immediately involved in the defending of the country, but who is involved in keeping the uh, wheels turning inside of it. Having said that, uh, my hopes are that uh, our uh, partners in uh, NATO will send enough uh, military equipment for our soldiers and generals to uh, push the Russians back uh, on the pre-war 
borders, which is the borders of 1991. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I hope that we will negotiate uh, with Russia on what terms we will live next, because Russia is our neighbor. You know, it's kind of uh, hard thing having a crazy neighbor, but uh, <laughs> you, you don't choose your neighbors. You just, you know, try to adapt to living beside them. Do you have anything that you want to add that we haven't talked about? When Russian troops withdrew from Kyiv, I uh, shifted to experiencing the war for, uh, through the screen, through my smartphone, as everybody else uh, in Europe. And I felt like I can lose the touch with reality by doing j just that. So I went to one of the cities that were on the front side, close to the front lines, uh, in the south. I went to Mykolaiv. So I went there uh, and spent two weeks in a city without running water. It was an interesting experience. Learned a lot uh, about how to survive without water. It actually helped uh, later in the winter when Russian attacks broke the water supply in Kyiv for uh, some time. Uh, and I brought you as volunteer uh, combat medic with me to uh, try and train the uh, mobilized troops there. We ended up not treating anyone, but uh, simply helping local volunteers. And uh, my US friend went to uh, Donetsk Oblast later uh, after that. And I was uh, pretty sure that something big will start on at the beginning of the May, because Russians tried to you know, break through Ukrainian defenses in the south and finish their assault on Odessa city. They failed, uh, obviously, uh, as anyone can see now. But on my way back, I spent a day in Odessa with uh, my friend. She is a journalist who spent the first week of the war in Mariupol, um, the city utterly destroyed by a uh, Russian assault in the first month of the war. And actually by spending this time with her and uh, listening to her stories about what it's like to be in the city that is uh, utterly destroyed by artillery file or fire, by tank assaults, by uh, all the hostilities of the war. And seeing her light ephemeral attitude uh, towards all of this and uh, how she was just really chill about everything that is going on right now in her life. She lost her uh, apartment, she lost all of her things and all of her belongings, yet she managed to uh, escape the city when it was surrounded and she managed to take her husband with her who was uh, actually serving a police officer by, you know, tricking the uh, Russian soldiers into you know, losing consciousness and needing a medic and just uh, you know di diverting their attention from her husband who was like in the car and um, she was uh, such an amazing person uh, such a uh, light -hearted hearted and optimistic about everything that I asked her, oh, well, uh, teach me to do that. Uh, I feel like I want to help uh, th those people, those soldiers who are left in Mariupol, but I cannot, I do not know what to do. And it uh, is eating me from the inside. And she, she said, listen, if you desperately want to help, but do not know how to help or whom to help or what you should do, it is a symptom that that you need help. So look for help and try to help yourself. This will be the best thing you can do in these circumstances. And I thought like, well, sounds reasonable. What can I do? And she said, I have a psychotherapist. Do you want a contact? And I said, sure, <laughs> please share. And she gave me this contact of a therapist who lives in Germany, but comes from Ukraine, with whom I solved all of my psychological problems and dealt with all my anxiety in like two to three months 
months uh, using the cognitive behavioral therapy as a uh, therapy of choice. This was one of the best decisions in my life ever. And it came just at the right time, just when I was on the brink of, uh, you know, committing myself to something that I really does not help me and does not affect something relevant. So this was the lesson that I took from her and for which I am really grateful for her that if you really strive to help but do not know what to do help yourself it will do be the best for everyone Merci beaucoup d'avoir regardé cette vidéo. Si elle vous a plu, n'hésitez pas à la liker, la commenter, la partager. C'est très utile pour le développement de la chaîne. N'hésitez pas aussi à vous abonner, ça me ferait très plaisir. Et moi, je vous dis à dimanche prochain. Bisous